also.
Good morning. Welcome to Reformed Presbyterian Church. Uh, we pray that your time together with us is uh, meaningful and blessed. We are blessed to be here, to gather together, to worship our Lord. And part of our time together is to offer a blessing back to God in our worship and our praise of him. And, and we'll, uh, we'll do that corporately here in just a minute, but first I want to give a couple quick announcements. First is that this Sunday is Amen Bingo for the kids. So if you haven't already grabbed your Amen Bingo sheet and you're a child, please go get one. Although if that helps you follow along as an adult, I mean, hey, go for it. You just probably won't get a prize at the end. Uh, also, a, just a quick birthday announcement. I'm not sure if she's here this morning, but today is Ruth Lilly's 86th birthday. So that is great. It's a blessing to have wonderful saints who have been with us for so many years. And so she's just a quick example of someone to celebrate and to, uh, to cheer on. Let's uh, approach our God this morning. Uh, in worship as we uh, read from Psalm 103 responsibly. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, indeed it is a privilege and a blessing to come into your presence this morning as your body, as your church, to come and worship you, to bring you honor and glory and to be reminded of all the blessings that we have through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Give us open ears and attentive hearts to hear from you this morning, to hear from your word, to join in worship and praise as we sing to you, and as we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning. May you nourish us and feed us, your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
remain standing as we confess our faith together this morning using the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's join together in worship.
may be seated. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can be seated for a moment. I'd like to welcome you again to Reformed Presbyterian Church. Uh, I'm glad you're here to worship with us this morning. Thank you to the music team uh, for all that they do. Uh, holy is the Lord. Uh, we are privileged to gather together. Uh, our song said, the whole earth is filled with his glory. And in this sanctuary are men and women that God created in his image. So now that you've seated for a whole 30 seconds, please get up and greet one another. <laughs> Thank you. And I would like to take a moment to extend a greeting to those of you who are visiting with us for the first time. If that's the case, uh, please stop at our Welcome Center in the Narthex, and we have a, a gift for you. We're really glad you're here today. And uh, as our ushers are coming forward, they are distributing registration uh, books. We appreciate if you would uh, fill those out. Let us know uh, who you are, uh, regular members. We appreciate you're registering your attendance too. It's very helpful, very helpful to us. And uh, at this time, we have uh, a couple of reports, if you will. I thought it would be appropriate for us to do this before the pastoral prayer so that we can thank God. Rick Bernarducci is going to come up now and uh, tell us a little bit about the ESL ministry that just concluded uh, about a week ago. Rick. Good morning. We got our slide coming up. Where'd he go? <laughs> uh, first, I want to thank everyone for supporting the first year of our ESL program. We started this program not knowing exactly how much of a need there was in effort for this. God certainly provided a lot of students, so many that we had to turn a few away. Technology. Oh, okay. The first year we had 52 students registered and averaged about 16 to 20 students a night. One night we had 26. For this reason, the difference between the registered students and the average attendance each week was due to their job, job or work schedule change and some moved out of the area. I understand from other ESL directors, this is very common. We have heard from a few of our students that they have 
they have gotten better jobs to support their families because of what they have learned in our ESL program. Other students have told us he has been taking ESL classes twice a week online, but said he has learned more at our class than he does there. It's so rewarding to know that we can make a difference, especially in something that we take for granted every day. We are looking forward to start up ESL classes again in September. You will see pictures of our students. And we held a, a year-end covered dish uh, last week, and we had uh, 61 students, teachers, volunteers, and family members attended. There's Tim's cake. Uh, if you're if you helped with the ESL in the past year, please stand. I want to personally thank each of you for making a difference in the lives of our students. We are thinking of starting a few new things in September, but we'll need more help, teachers and volunteers, for these new programs. If you have any questions, please see myself or one of the volunteers. Thank you again for all your prayers. And uh, thank you all the volunteers as well. It's really a remarkable, remarkable ministry right here in uh, downtown Ephrata. And also this morning we have uh, John Mugo here from She Saves the Nation. He's the director. And as you know, Emmanuel Milando is now uh, ministering with that ministry in Africa. And since John is in town, we thought we'd hear from him. Pastor Mugo, would you please come and share with us? His daughter, Sheila, is with him as well. Yes, my name is John Mugo from Kenya, Africa. I'm the director of She Saves the Nation. And uh, I came here today, this being my second time, to thank you all, uh, Reformed Presbyterian Church, your pastor and leadership, for your support for our organization that deals with girls in high school and elementary school, the supply of sanitary pads and soap and oil for their skin. And uh, every year you, from 2019, you have sent Emmanuel Mulondo to come. And uh, again, this year he came and uh, it was a terrible time in Kenya with the floods. But by the grace of God, we were still able to serve the two schools, uh, even though schools were off but the schools were able to call a few students to come and receive the gifts. Uh, the country was flooded. Most parts of the country was flooding. Uh, we experienced lot of, lots of destructions and deaths of some people, but we blessed the Lord that uh, we were, Mlondo and I, and the team from She Saves the Nation were able to support the two schools this time. The school programs in Kenya run in three trimesters. The first one begins in January, the second one in May, and the last one begins in September. And so every time Emmanuel comes, and with the support from this church, we are able to support the girls during their second trimester that covers March, I mean, that covers May to August. And with that, we say a big thank you I know, uh, Pastor Tim, uh, Emmanuel Mulondo has a comprehensive report of all the roads that we cruised in the, with the flooding as we went to these schools and even with the girls receiving the supplies. We want to say thank you very much. The Lord bless you. 
even as you continue to support the work that we are doing in Kenya and the continent of Africa. Thank you so much. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Almighty God, yours is an everlasting kingdom. Your reign is, is over all. You are our creator, our sustainer, and our redeemer. And, oh Lord, we give you thanks for meeting us in our helpless place by giving us your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have the forgiveness of sins, through whom we have the presence of your spirit, through whom we have the promise of everlasting life forever with you and abundant life now. We're also grateful, Lord, that in this time and in this place in history, we have the opportunity with the lives you've given us, the gifts you've given us to serve you. We thank you so much for the report that we've heard from Rick this morning. We thank you for the, the numbers of, of people who have come to learn English from so many different nations, Lord, around the world. Indeed, reminding us every week that the promise to Abraham is being fulfilled in our very eyes, that through his offspring, all the nations of the earth, the families of the earth would be blessed. And so we see uh, the nations coming here to, to our doors. And we thank you for Rick and for the volunteers and pray that you would continue to give them wisdom as they seek to uh, serve the needs of these folks in our community and also Lord may these truly lead to gospel conversations as as many have and we pray that uh, you would be leading leading uh, people to you and father we thank you for pastor John we thank you for the ministry of she saves the nation we thank you for uh, Emmanuel and pray that you would continue to bless this ministry <clears throat> reaching out to, to families in Africa, Lord. Uh, we know the need is great, and we know the gospel is uh, amazing, and we pray that you would continue to extend that reach through this ministry uh, in Africa. Father, for our, our church family now, we pray as, as we gather today, we are mourning with uh, Kathy Rudder at the loss of her brother Jim, uh, also Matt Hildebrand's brother Jim, and we pray that you would please be uh, giving your comfort during these days as his, his passing was uh, unexpected. But Father, we know that you are sovereign over all things and that Jim was uh, a man who looked to you. And so we pray that his family would be comforted uh, in these times and in these days. And Lord, we are, we're grateful that you've been with uh, Chris Thomas over the last week and a half as she's undergone radiation therapy, and we pray now that you would give the doctors wisdom as they consider uh, next steps for her. Please be with Chris and Fred in these days. And we thank you that Angie's procedure was successful this week, and we pray that the biopsy would bring good news to her. And uh, we pray for uh, Sarah Johnson, who will be undergoing surgery tomorrow, Lord, that you would give her your peace, that you would give her uh, trust in you and give skill to the doctors as they care for her. And also, Lord, for David Voss, as he um, anticipates the, the first of, of two amputations, the first being tomorrow, we pray that you would give him your peace and, Lord, that there would be no complications. We pray that the rehabilitation would, would go well and uh, be with uh, David and Rachel uh, and Marilyn uh, during the coming weeks as they will uh, be walking together through very challenging, very challenging procedures. But, oh, Lord, once again, we thank you that you are our great physician. And we rejoice that uh, you are the one who will walk with them uh, through these days, and may they and all know that we have a family of believers who care for one another and support one another in our times of need. 
Father, we are grateful for the way you have blessed us so richly, and we are grateful that you give us the opportunity to uh, do your work here and to support it around the world. And so we pray that the tithes and offerings we are about to receive would be pleasing and honoring to you. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll now receive this morning's tithes and offerings.
Last week, I introduced you to our summer series entitled Kingdom Living, based on the Beatitudes found at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, verses 3 to 12. And uh, they're called the Beatitudes because of the ascription of blessedness at the beginning of each verse. And we saw last week that the word blessed or makarioi in the Greek text means happy, truly, deeply happy. But I think a uh, quote I read to you last week, I'll read to you again because it gives us the heart of what that means lest we misunderstand. R.C. Sproul said that happiness is involved, but blessedness is a particular kind of happiness. It's a supreme dimension of happiness. It's not a passing fit of glee or delight, but it is something that penetrates to the deepest chambers of our souls by which the soul is overwhelmed by a sense of sweetness and delight and satisfaction and contentment that knows no bounds. That's what we're talking about when we talk about the blessedness of these beatitudes. So Jesus is telling us that the people who are truly happy in this sense are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the pure in heart, the merciful, peacemakers, and those who are persecuted for righteousness. So last week we had an introduction to the series, and today we're going to look at the first beatitude in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, but I thought it would be important throughout the course of our, our study that we could just read the beatitudes together and see the context of each one. So I encourage you to read along with me as we consider uh, the Word of God this morning. <clears throat> Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountains, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Almighty God, we pray that you would be guiding our thoughts today as we consider your word. Uh, we are grateful uh, for our Savior's teaching, his life, his death, his resurrection, and ascension for us. And we thank you in his name. Amen. So last week we saw that each of the Beatitudes has a certain formula. There's first that ascription of blessedness, blessed. And then there's a description of the person to whom the blessing applies, in this case, the poor in spirit. And then the reason that they are blessed, there's a promise, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And just a reminder that the kingdom refers to the reign of God, specifically with the coming of the messianic king, a promise from days of old, King Jesus comes with the coming of the king, the kingdom has come. And there's a sense in which this kingdom will be revealed in even greater fullness when Jesus returns, in glory, and so we live in that already not yet dynamic that we see during these days. And last week I mentioned that kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are to be taken interchangeably, but I thought it might be worth commenting on why in Matthew's gospel he uses the expression kingdom of God, excuse me, kingdom of heaven 32 times. But none of the other gospels use the expression kingdom of heaven, they use kingdom of God. So remember that Matthew was writing to uh, a Jewish audience, and it was more appropriate when writing to Jewish audiences because the Jews would not speak the name of God, Yahweh. They would often substitute heaven when referring to him, and so that's, I believe, why we have this use of kingdom of heaven here in Matthew's gospel. I also think today that we're going to be seeing that uh, there's not a random order to these. I think you'll see 
why this one comes first. But I wonder, what do you think, if I were to write a book called How to Become Wealthy Through Poverty, how do you think it would sell? I don't think it would sell too well. It would probably bring up thoughts of abuses of the welfare system or something like that. But yet Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we're going to be looking at what it is not, what this poor of spirit, poverty of spirit is not, and we're going to be looking at what it is. So first of all, what it does not mean. First of all, blessed are the poor in spirit does not apply to financial poverty. Now, the Bible does not teach that poverty in and of itself is meritorious or blessed. The parallel passage in Luke chapter 6 teaches, it does say merely blessed are the poor, but the whole context of Luke chapter 6 implies that together with that goes the kind of poverty of spirit that Jesus is talking about here. When the poor are committed in the Bible, uh, the accompanying poverty of spirit is implied if not stated. The poor are more likely to be humble before the Lord and dependent upon the Lord, but not necessarily. If this blessing was connected to material poverty directly, then the pressure would be off to help the poor, wouldn't it? Because the blessing is theirs. And if you think on the other side of the matter, think about what Jesus has to say about those who are materially wealthy. He warns of the danger to those who are materially wealthy, how difficult it is for them to enter the kingdom of heaven. And why is that the case? Well, it's not because wealth in and of itself disqualifies a person from the kingdom of heaven, but rather because those who are wealthy are more likely to be self-sustaining, independent, self-sufficient, and self-reliant, not reliant on anything or anybody and not even God. So we know that being materially wealthy, nothing in and of itself that is wrong with that. Abraham was very wealthy, was he not? And uh, Solomon was very, very wealthy. But we do, see, we do see that picture in Luke chapter 18 where the rich young ruler comes and he's unwilling to give up that which is kept, keeps him from full discipleship with his wealth. And you remember Jesus said, easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who said, heard this said, who can be saved? And when Jesus said, what's impossible with man is possible with God. And what I love about that section of Luke's gospel is in the very next chapter, you see a rich guy named Zacchaeus who enters the kingdom. So Jesus makes the impossible possible. So it's not a matter of physical, material wealth, or poverty here either. So it's not that, and neither is it the blessing of being poor in spirit. It's not as if at some kind of personality type. It's not as if we need to walk around as a bunch of weaklings and wimps. No, this isn't some challenge to the virtue of courage, physical strength, or strength of will or conviction. And again, you think of characters in the Bible who were very strong in this way, but were people, people of God. So it's not a question of physical wealth. And it's also not a question of personality type. But what does it mean to be poor in spirit? I think there are three things. First of all, poor in spirit are those who understand that in and of ourselves, we are completely bankrupt without any assets before the Lord. And so you can make some fiscal analogies here. It's embarrassing to think that you have some assets, a balance in your account, and then to discover, I'm sure no one here has ever had a bounce check. I'm sure no one here has ever gone to the restaurant and said, sir, I'm sorry, that credit card doesn't work. We've had, we've, that's embarrassing for sure. It's very easy to overestimate your credit in that way. Especially, and I don't know what's happened, but there was a time not too long ago when I used to get five credit card offers in the mail every week. And it's not as many anymore, but it makes you think you've got a lot more credit 
than you really do. And think how distorted our thinking is when it comes to these things. Think about it that you're deemed a poor credit risk if you've only ever paid cash for everything because you haven't established your credit. Pretty upside down. And also, there was a sign in a loan company window that said, now you can borrow enough money to get completely out of debt. <laughs> but uh, some, uh, some businesses are not quite as trusting. Uh, apparently, a Fort Lauderdale restaurant had this sign, if you are 80 years old and accompanied by your parents, you may pay by check. <laughs> but then once your uh, credit is established, everybody wants to lend you money. But when it comes to our spiritual accounts before the Lord, we're far too eager to give ourselves credit. If you ask people what they have of value in their spiritual accounts, they will co what will commend them to God, they will often say, because I have a nice balance of good works. And last week, in our introduction to the Sermon on the Mount, we, we warned one another that while certainly the Sermon on the Mount is filled with moral virtue, it is not designed to be the pathway to heaven. Because no one can keep the Sermon on the Mount, as we saw, Matthew 5, 48. You are therefore to be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So Jesus dispossessed them of the notion that they could attain that perfection. And as if that wasn't enough, then you know... In the Sermon on the Mount, later he goes on to those who would still presume that they can be good enough. He says, you've heard that it is said, you shall not commit murder. Oh, nobody here. I don't, anybody here commit murder? No. Jesus says, but I tell you, he who has been angry with his brother is guilty. Angry with his brother without cause. Then he goes on to say, he says, you've heard that it is said, thou, you shall not commit adultery. But I say that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Being confident of our own works as a way to heaven is like climbing a ladder only to realize that it's against the wrong wall. John Calvin said it deserves our attention that only he who is reduced to nothing in himself and relies on the mercy of God, is poor in spirit. But isn't it interesting that throughout the course of history, there have been those who have, who have actually institutionalized uh, the principles here, who have developed a, a movement known as a monastic movement that is designed to, to keep, uh, for example, a vow of poverty, often drawn from this idea found in the Sermon on the Mount. But even the monastic movement itself can be exactly the opposite of being poor in spirit because it actually leads people to a confidence in this road that they have taken that will attain everlasting life. Not so. So, secondly, to be poor in spirit not only means to recognize your account is empty, but that you have a whole stack of large overbill overdue bills. It's one thing to come to the end of the month and have no positive balance in your account. It's another thing to come to the end of the month. Have you ever done this? You've paid all your bills, oh, but there is one over there that I forgot. Uh-oh, one more. We have spiritual debts, don't we, when we sin. We use the terminology when we say the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We use this word because it's the most accurate translation of the word that's used in Matthew's rendering of the Lord's Prayer. I'd like to introduce you to a, a, a new term this morning. Uh, this is not, inflation is not a new term, is it? Inflation, we all know about inflation. And it's been compounding over the last uh, few years. But I would like to introduce you to a term that I call sinflation. Sinflation. And so we have the stack of transgressions and sins that we commit. They just keep compounding. 
There are sins of commission, things that we do that we shouldn't have done. We have sins of omission, things that we should do that we don't do. I may have mentioned this before, heard about the Sunday school class who was teaching her children about what sins of omission are. And one of the little boys said, it's a sin we should have committed but didn't. <laughs> well, I think she corrected him, I hope. But the perfect example of sins of omission are found right here in Matthew's gospel. Matthew 25, he will say to them on those on that day, depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. I was naked and you did not clothe me. I was sick in prison and you did not visit me. So you have sins of commission and sins of omission. And then there are, there are sub-stacks within those stacks, not words, thoughts, deeds, motives. And you say, I'm not a bad credit risk. Oh, my friends, in and of ourselves, we are bankrupt. We are destitute. And our liability grows deeper and deeper as our transgressions multiply over the days, months, and years. I had a friend some years ago who found himself with years of overdue bills, mostly plastic, which resulted in plastic poverty. And he filed for personal bankruptcy. That was very, very humbling to him. Whenever we file for bankruptcy, it's humbling. For us, to be poor in spirit means to see our desperate situation clearly. Understanding that if we were to appear before a holy and righteous God in this condition, we would surely be held to account for our debts. But that's not the end of the story, thankfully. Because the poor in spirit are those who declare spiritual bankruptcy, repent, and rest in the completed work of Jesus. That's where the poverty of spirit brings us. A contrast is given in Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. Remember in the temple, the Pharisee who stood and proudly prayed, I thank you, Lord, that I am not like other people. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. But the tax collector beat his chest and prayed, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And Jesus said, this man went home justified. This is the man who, this is what poverty of spirit looks like. Coming to the end of ourselves. Peter said, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you at the proper time. Alexander McLaren wrote, We have something that is our own, and that is our will. We have lifted it up against God, and if a man's position as a dependent creature should take all lofty looks and high spirit out of him, his condition as a sinful man before God should lay him flat on his face in the presence of that majesty, and should make him put his hand on his lips and say from behind the covering, Unclean, unclean. If we would only go down to the depths of our own hearts, every one of us would find there more than enough to make all self-complacency and self-conceit utterly impossible, as it ought to be for us forever. Can you see that this is the reason why this beatitude comes first? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And when we come to that point, then we come to understand what John the Baptist said when he began his preaching ministry. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when Jesus began his preaching ministry, he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We come to that, that realization in our poverty of spirit that we have nothing in our hands that we can bring. Only to Christ we can cling. And so, the word repent, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, means to turn. Literally, it means to turn in the Old Testament rendering. The New Testament word is metanoia, a compound word, which means the root of the word is nous, with a prefix meta, and it means to change direction, turn around. The Apostle Paul understood this, didn't he? 
as a perfect example of someone whose life was transformed, whose life changed from one direction to another through his encounter with Jesus Christ. Before Paul met Jesus, he was full of himself. He was assured of his own self-righteousness. He was assured that he had kept the law. In his letter to the Philippians, he says, he was circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. Paul grew up in the right family. He went to the right church, if you will. And he thought he had done a good job at keeping the law, but after his encounter with Christ, Paul was brought to the reality and he said, whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. He saw that any value, any righteousness that was any good to him was the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So that's an honest assessment that we need to come to. Maybe, you've, maybe you're here today and maybe you have been trusting in your own assets of, of good works. Oh, sure, you're better than the guy down the street or the person that you work with. But Jesus says, you're to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And so you need the forgiveness of Jesus Christ that he came to bring. But not only does he, not only does he cancel the debt, he puts a righteousness in our account <clears throat> by his grace, his righteousness. This is what the Westminster Shorter Catechism tells us about justification by faith. What is justification by faith? Justification is an act of God's free grace, wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight, only for the righteousness of Christ placed to our account and received by faith alone. It's what a great, a friend of mine calls a great switcheroo. Our sin placed his account, his righteousness placed to our account. Remember what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. He said, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. That through his poverty, you might become rich. And this is not man's way of looking at things. I love the way the prophet Isaiah puts it. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord, for my thoughts are your, not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Jim Boyce used to tell the story of a hiker who took a tumble, slipped over a cliff, grabbed a sapling on the way down, and he was crying out for help. A booming voice came out of the, so out of the sky. It is I. The climber screamed, save me. The voice said, let go of the branch. The hiker said, is there anybody else up there? Well, my friends, the answer is no. There's nobody else up there. And so, have you come to the point in your life where you have declared spiritual bankruptcy? I pray that you have and found the glory of the riches of the righteousness of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness that only he, he can offer. And for each of us, as we continue our walk with the Lord, Yes, the Beatitudes are, are things that, that should guide us and, and, and direct us to, to kingdom living. It's so countercultural and counterintuitive, is it not, to be poor in spirit. But the very first of the 95 theses of Martin Luther said, all of life is repentance. And so every day for us as believers is a day of finding our, our wealth in Christ and recognizing our own, our own poverty. Because it's only then, it's only through that gate of the poverty of spirit that we can be citizens of the kingdom of heaven.
then by his grace, we begin to be characterized by these other attributes that are truly, truly blessed as we grow in our love for him and for one another. Let's pray. Almighty God, we are so grateful today that you have given us the gift of your son. We're so grateful that you've given us your word as a, a mirror to, to take a look at ourselves, our own hearts, our own minds, our own lives. And Father, we recognize that apart from his work on our behalf, we would have no hope. We would have no help. But now, the riches of glory have come to us through Christ. But I pray today, Lord, I ask if there's anyone here today who has, who has not yet declared bankruptcy in that spiritual sense, who's been trusting in their own, in their own goodness, Lord, I pray that, that they would see that 100% is not possible only Jesus Christ was the one who perfectly kept the law. So I pray that they would, as the scriptures say, repent, would turn from that way to, to Christ. And for each one of us, Father, we pray that you would always bring us on our knees to the foot of the cross uh, once again daily to remember uh, the faithfulness of Jesus Christ in coming for us and, and taking upon us the burden of sin which we could not even begin to imagine its depth and height. But instead, it's been replaced by the breadth, the height, the length, and the depth of, of your love. So we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I'd like to ask the elders if you would come up who are serving uh, the Lord's table today. In uh, just a few moments, uh, the elders will be taking their positions on either side of me, and you can come at, uh, at your leisure uh, with others to receive the elements, the bread, uh, and the cup that remind us of the work of uh, Jesus Christ on our behalf. And uh, this table is for all who have trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if you have done that, if you're a member of this or another uh, evangelical church where Christ is uh, proclaimed and his word is honored. We invite you to partake in these elements with us uh, this morning. And talk about blessedness. Psalm 32, you know, David was coming out of his, one of the darkest times, with his sin. You know, Psalm 51 is also parallel to this. But David writes, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. And so we come to the table this morning. Remember this fundamental, this fundamental blessedness that no one can take away from you if you trusted in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is good news, my friends. That's a blessedness you carry with you every day, everywhere you go. You also notice that David says, um, And in whose spirit there is no deceit. You know, as we come to this table today, we remember, we, we know that we're not perfect. We know that there's still sin that, that clings to us. And Martin Luther's final words, scrabbled, written on a piece of paper, says, we are beggars. I know it. And we come, we're coming still in poverty and spirit because we know that there's that distance between what we are and what we are called to be. But Jesus is not finished with us. He uses this as a reminder uh, of the cost that our salvation was, but also his determination to conform us to the image of, son, of his son, which is underway now, but w which will be completed on the day when we meet him face to face. 
But always as we anticipate partaking of these elements with these thoughts in mind, uh, we want to observe a few moments of silent, uh, silent confession. Uh, let's do that, and I'll close us in a moment. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Just a reminder also that the bread is all gluten-free, and we will have uh, an elder uh, in the back if you would like prayer for a particular matter. Apostle Paul wrote, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that on the night in which was betrayed, Jesus took bread. After he had given thanks, he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the, the Lord's death until he comes. Please come.
at your seats. Lord our God, we are grateful for this reminder of our need and your gift. We pray that uh, you would fill us with your spirit and uh, remind us every day of your blessing upon each one of us. Fill us with your spirit and help us to walk in a way that's, that's pleasing to you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for our closing hymn. And as we sing, remember, uh, on this Sunday, we take an extra offering. This is for a deacon's fund, a love offering for those in need. And we will stand after we take that offering. I'll give you the signal. <laughs>
receive these words. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated just for a moment. We have several announcements for you. First, uh, I'll invite Alicia Weaver up to talk a little bit about Kingdom Kids. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks so much for all you guys are already committed to doing for Kingdom Kids this summer. Tammy has done a great job with taking the reins from me, which I've really appreciated. And thank you all for supporting her so well. Um, she couldn't be here today, so she asked me to make the announcement for um, the churchwide canvassing that we're doing for our community. Um, so what that's going to be is um, after church next Sunday at 11 o'clock is an all-volunteer meeting. So if you are helping in any way with Kingdom Kids, um, whether you're with the children or whether you're just registration or kitchen, please attend. Um, sorry, I'm like, my heart's beating. I like rushed to get here. <laughs> I was in the nursery. Um, and that is, oh, it says in the sanctuary. So here at 11 o'clock next week. Um, and then right after that, this is going to be like a 15 minute meeting. Then at 11.15, we're going to transition to the canvassing event. Um, and so um, we'll have a little bit of like a training, an intro, what are we going to do. Um, you'll get, we'll break into small groups and you'll be given a map of somewhere to go. You'll have to prop, some of us will probably drive to the locations. Um, and we'll spend an hour from 11.30 to 12.30 just knocking on doors, handing out invitations along the streets. And if nobody answers, you know, you just leave it there at the door. And so we'll give you some like sentence starters to get you started. Um, I'm really excited about this. We did something similar in London with Leap um, six years ago or something. And it was just, it was so encouraging. It was really a blessing to me, um, whether the people receive it or not. So I hope that you consider joining us. Um, and it's not for just people that are involved with Kingdom Kids. It's the whole church. So um, please, please consider um, coming out and Tammy wanted me to mention how um, Pastor Beck a couple weeks ago was saying how our church has always been open door to the community, and she was hoping that a lot of you would be encouraged um, from his sermon to participate with us, too. Um, afterwards, if you participate, um, we will have a light lunch at 12.30. So please do sign up in the Narthex so that we know how much lunch to get. Um, and of course, kids are invited encouraged to come. So that's everything. If you have questions, you can talk to me after the, after the service here. Thank you. All right. A few other announcements. Oh, drop my pencil. Okay. Uh, please uh, read your bulletin, especially the first Sunday of the month here. We have the June focus is in there with some additional details. Uh, and please uh, use these bulletins and uh, refer to them. Uh, a couple things that are in the bulletin I want to highlight real quickly. Um, Mom's Summer Park Series begins this Tuesday, and it's at Fox Meadows. And it's Mom's Summer Park Series, not <laughs> everyone. But if you like Fox Meadows, hey, go for it. Uh, and then uh, there is a Ladies Fellowship Lunch on Wednesday morning as well. Also, now that we're into the summer, it's Summer Fellowship Hour, which starts next Sunday. But in order to have fellowship with snacks, we need people to sign up for those snacks. So please, uh, maybe as a small group, you want to sign up to, to provide snacks. And there actually is a QR code. That's the fancy term for the little square that you can use uh, with your phone to sign up. So you can actually use the QR code. And there's... There's two QR codes in our bulletin this morning, which might be a record. Um, <laughs> the other one is for Kingdom Kids. So if you accidentally get that one, just sign up your kids while you're on that. And then sign up on the other uh, QR code for Summer Fellowship Hour. 
since church is over, you can get your phone out and do that. Uh, lastly, uh, if you're an elder at RPC, please come up front real quickly for a, a brief meeting. Uh, for the rest of you, you are dismissed. Have a great Lord's Day.